the water of life. There once was a king who had an illness, and no one believed that he would come out of it with his life. He had three sons who were much distressed about it, and went down to the palace garden and wept. There they met an old man who inquired as to the cause of their grief. They told him that their father was so ill that he would most certainly die, for nothing seemed to cure him. Then the old man said, I know of one more remedy, and that is the water of life. If he drinks of it, he will become well again, but it is hard to find. The elder said, I will manage to find it, and went to the sick king and begged to be allowed to go forth in search of the water of life, for that alone could save him. No, said the king, the danger of it is too great, I would rather die. But he begged so long that the king consented. The prince thought in his heart, if I bring the water, then I shall be best beloved of my father, and shall inherit the kingdom. So he set out, and when he had ridden forth a little distance, a dwarf stood there in the road, who called to him and said, Whither away so fast? Silly shrimp, said the prince very haughtily. It is nothing to do with you, and rode on. But the little dwarf had grown angry, and had wished an evil wish. Soon after this the prince entered a ravine, and further he rode, the closer the mountains drew together, and at last the road became so narrow that he could not advance a step further. It was impossible either to turn his horse or to dismount from the saddle, and he was shut in there as if in prison. The sick king waited long for him, but he came not. Then the second son said, Father, let me go forth to seek the water, and thought to himself, If my brother is dead, then the kingdom will fall to me. At first the king would not allow him to go either, but at last he yielded. So the prince set out on the same road that his brother had taken, and he too met the dwarf, who stopped him to ask whither he was going in such haste. Little shrimp, said the prince, that is nothing to do with you, and rode on without giving him another look. But the dwarf bewitched him, and he, like the other, rode into a ravine, and could neither go forwards nor backwards. So fair haughty people. As the second son also remained away, the youngest begged to be allowed to go forth to fetch the water, and at last the king was obliged to let him go. When he met the dwarf, and the latter asked him whither he was going in such haste, he stopped, gave him an explanation, and said, I am seeking the water of life, for my father is sick unto death. Do you know then where that is to be found? No, said the prince. As you have borne yourself, as is seemly and not haughtily like your false brothers, I will give you the information and tell you how you may obtain the water of life. It springs from a fountain in the courtyard of an enchanted castle, but you will not be able to make your way to it if I do not give you an iron wand and two small loaves of bread. Strike thrice with the wand on the iron door of the castle, and it will spring open. 
Inside lie two lions with gaping jaws. But if you throw a loaf to each of them, they will be quieted. Then hasten to fetch some of the water of life before the clock strikes twelve, else the door will shut again and you will be imprisoned. The prince thanked him, took the wand and the bread, and set out on his way. When he arrived, everything was as the dwarf had said. The door sprang open at the third stroke of the wand. And when he had appeased the lions with the bread, he entered the castle and came to a large and splendid hall wherein sat some enchanted princes whose rings he drew off their fingers. A sword and a loaf of bread were lying there, which he carried away. After this, he entered a chamber in which was a beautiful maiden who rejoiced when she saw him, kissed him, and told him that he had set her free and should have the whole of her kingdom and that if he would return in a year, their wedding should be celebrated. Likewise, she told him where the spring of the water of life was, and that he was to hasten and draw some of it before the clock struck twelve. Then he went onwards, and at last entered a room where there was a beautiful newly made bed, and as he was very weary, he felt inclined to rest a little, so he lay down and fell asleep. When he awoke, it was striking quarter to twelve. He sprang up in a fright, ran to the spring, drew some water in a cup which stood near, and hastened away. But just as he was passing through the iron door, the clock struck twelve and the door fell to with such violence that it carried away a piece of his heel. He, however, rejoicing at having obtained the water of life, went homewards and again passed the dwarf. When the latter saw the sword and the loaf, he said, With these you have won great wealth. With the sword you can slay whole armies and the bread will never come to an end. But the prince would not go home to his father without his brothers, and said, Dear dwarf, can you not tell me where my brothers are? They went out before I did in search of the water of life, and have not returned. They are imprisoned between two mountains said the dwarf. I have condemned them to stay there because they were so haughty. Then the prince begged until the dwarf's dwarf released them, but he warned him and said, Beware of them, for they have bad hearts. When his brothers came, he rejoiced and told them how things had gone with him that he had found the water of life and has brought a cup full away with him and had rescued a beautiful princess who was willing to wait a year for him and then their wedding was to be celebrated and he would obtain a great kingdom. After that they rode on together and chanced upon a land where war and famine reigned, and the king already thought he must perish, for the scarcity was so great. Then the prince went to him and gave him the loaf, wherewith he fed and satisfi satisfied the whole of his kingdom, and then the prince gave him the sword, also wherewith he slew the hosts of his enemies and could now live in rest and peace. The prince then took back his loaf and his sword, and the three brothers rode on. 
But after this, they entered two more countries where war and famine reigned, and each time the prince gave his loaf and his sword to the king, and had now delivered three kingdoms. And after that, they went on board a ship and sailed over the sea. During the passage. The two elders conversed apart and said, "The youngest has found the water of life, and not we, for that our father will give him the kingdom, the kingdom which belongs to us, and he will rob us of all our fortune." They then began to seek revenge and plotted with each other to destroy him. They waited until they found him fast asleep. Then they poured the water of life out of the cup and took it for themselves. But into the cup they poured salt seed water. Now, therefore, when they arrived home, the youngest took his cup to the sick king, in order that he might drink of it and be cured. But scarcely had he drunk a very little of the salt sea water, than he became still worse than before. And as he was lamenting over this, the two eldest brothers came and accused the youngest of having intended to poison him, and said that they had brought him the true water of life and handed it to him. He had scarcely tasted it when he felt his sickness departing, and became strong and healthy. As in the days of his youth. After that, they both went to the youngest, mocked him, and said, "You certainly found the water of life, but you have had the pain, and we had the gain. You should have been cleverer, and should have kept your eyes open. We took it from you whilst you were asleep at sea." And when a year is over, one of us will go and fetch the beautiful princess. But beware, that you do not disclose aught of this to our father. Indeed, he does not trust you, and if you say a single word, you shall lose your life into the bargain. But if you keep silent, you shall have it is a gift. The old king was angry with the youngest son and thought he had plotted against his life. So he summoned the court together and had sentence pronounced upon his son, that he should be secretly shot. And once, when the prince was riding forth through the chase, suspect, suspecting no evil, the king's huntsman was told to go with him. And when they were quite alone in the forest, the huntsman looked so sorrowful that the prince said to him, "Dear huntsman, what ails you?" The huntsman said, "I cannot tell you, and yet I ought." Then the prince said, "Say openly what it is; I will pardon you." Alas," said the huntsman, "I am." To shoot you dead, the king has ordered me to do it. Then the prince was shocked and said, "Dear huntsman, let me live. There, I give you my royal garments. Give me your common ones in their stead." The huntsman said, "I will willingly do that. Indeed, I would not have been able to shoot you." Then they exchanged clothes, and the huntsman returned home, while the prince went further into the forest. After a time, three wagons of gold and precious stones came to the king for his youngest son, which were sent by the three kings who had slain their enemies with the prince's sword, and maintained their people with his bread. And who wished to show their gratitude for it? The old king then thought, "Can my son have been innocent?" And said to his people, "Would 
would that he were still alive. How it grieves me that I have suffered him to be killed. He still lives, said the huntsman. I could not find it in my heart to carry out your command. And told the king how he had happened. Then a stone fell from the king's heart, and he had it proclaimed in every country that his son might return and be taken into favor again. The princess, however, had a road made up to her palace, which was quite bright and golden, and told her people that whosoever came riding straight along it to her would be the right one and was to be admitted, and whoever rode by the side of it was not the right one and was not to be admitted. As the time was now close at hand, the, old, the eldest thought he would hasten to go to the king's daughter and give himself out as her rescuer, and thus win her for his bride and the kingdom to boot. Therefore he rode forth, and when he arrived in front of the palace and saw the splendid golden road, he thought, it would be a sin and a shame if I were to ride over that, and turned aside and rode on the right side of it. But when he came to the door, the servants told him that he was not the right one, and was to go away again. Soon after this, the second prince set out, and when he came to the golden road, and his horse had put one foot on it, he thought it would be a sin and a shame, a piece might be trodden off. And he turned aside and rode on the left side of it, and when he reached the door, the attendants told him he was not the right one, and he was to go away again. When at last the year had entirely expired, the third son likewise wished to ride out of the forest to his beloved, and with her forget his sorrows. So he set out and thought of her so incessantly and wished to be with her so much that he never noticed the golden road at all. So his horse ran onwards up the middle of it, and when he came to the door, it was opened, and the princess received him with joy, and said he was her savior, and lord of the kingdom, and their wedding was celebrated with great rejoicing. When it was over, she told him that his father invited him to come to him, and had forgiven him. So he rode thither, and told him everything, how his brothers had betrayed him, and how he had nevertheless kept silence. The old king wished to punish them, but they had put to sea, and never came back as long as they lived.